A very beautiful Thursday morning to you. Thanks for joining us here on New Frontiers Television. This is our morning show. We are set to take you on the ride this morning. Uh, we have interesting lineup for you. It's AM Live. I am Precious Amayo. I am Ola Jumoke Babalola. It's May 4th, 2017, and it is AM Live. Thank you for joining us. Well, my name is Adiola Adegoke. It feels good to be here again on uh, the, the first Thursday in the month of May. And uh, gradually, gradually, we're moving to the first half, to the end of the first half of the year. And it feels good. Yola, don't be in a hurry. It's still, it's still May. It's, still it's May. May. June is really June June is fast. Less than it's moving really fast, fast, but it's just May 4th. So, I mean, we can... I, I could practically yeah. say it looked like hours ago when we said yeah. happy new month. Yeah. Yes. Oh, come on. <laughs> I thought you were going to say New Year. Okay. No, but it, it's new. It's new. Well, it's a new month, quite all right. But let's relax a bit. Let's just think it gradually. It's just May. June is not here yet. When June comes, we can worry about the first half of the year. Okay. I don't want to have to bother about the first half of the year. And again, you should tell everyone that the year's moving fast. Yeah, exactly. You have to do. You need to do quick, so you mm -hmm. can have fun and spend the year wisely. Of course, make me a good deal of the year 2017. Exactly. True, true. You, you re really, I think this is myself and Jella were talking yesterday mm -hmm. that uh, the year's running and so is everyone getting older. She was saying the year's running, like, oh, please, I don't want my birthday to come. <laughs> <And> <laughs> so everyone is getting older, yes. irrespective of, you know, whether it's your birthday already or not your birthday. You're a day older mm -hmm. today. You're getting a day older every day. And the year is also running, actually. So you don't have much time to do that, which you said you want to do. You mm -hmm. better start now. Don't wait till, you know, we have this thing we do where we say, though i'll just start next half of the year the best time to start is now so start now all right big stories for you this morning uh the president again was absent at the federal executive council meeting yesterday and um lai mohammed has come to give us um some sort of explanation as to why he wasn't there there was also uh, a shooting yesterday at uh, texas uh, not uh, the college in texas and it's 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 sad story to see that uh, this situation is you know it's becoming a, 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 a report that people just turn their eyes away from now in, in the U.S. because it's becoming like a normal thing. Yes. And it shouldn't be allowed to become the norm. These are some of the big stories we're looking at this morning. But first, here in Nigeria, the president was absent again at the Federal Executive Council meeting yesterday. Um, he was said to be in the office, but just missed the Federal Executive Council meeting. Um, but Nigerians again took to social media to say, uh, I thought we said they said he's back in the office, mm -hmm. and the wife, uh, the Aisha Buhari, came out to say the husband's um, health, health is not as bad as people mm -hmm. perceive. So why is he not in the office? And Blai Mohammed gave an explanation as to that. He, 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 for the third time consecutively, the president has been away from the Federal Executive Council meeting, which was every Wednesday at, at the presidential villa. And of course, has it been the trend? The Minister for Information and Culture. Lai Mohammed has come up to give an explanation that doctors said the president needed to take some rest. He had to get back, get away from work, and of course stay back at home to rest. Not forgetting that on Tuesday, just a couple of days away, the president resumed office and he had a meeting with the AGF and of course the Minister of State for Petroleum Resources. But again, Nigerians are saying there's so much secrecy clouding the old status of the president's health. You should. What we, we have spokesman for the president, he's not giving any information as a way. We have the Minister of, of Culture and Information being the spokesman for the president in recent days. But of course, the question on the lips of everyone is, what exactly is wrong with the president? He did mention when he got back from London that he had to go back for further checkups. Mm -hmm. But he's not gone for that. He's only been away from office and of course we will make understand that he's working for home. But we're asking, everyone's asking, we need some accurate, tangible information about the health of the president. Well, while it's good that the president wants to take his rest, of course, uh, we're all humans. We know that there are times when the body needs rest. While it's good that the president wants to do that, uh, we, we should also know that the, the fate of Nigeria is hanging on the shoulders of the president. If the president is missing meetings, uh, important meetings, uh, we, we knew he, uh, he held a closed door. We were told he had a closed door meeting with Minister of Petroleum. And, but again, the Federal Executive Council is a meeting the president is not supposed to miss. Uh, to miss. I'm making it the third time. And uh, well, we do hope that the president is in good condition. And Nigerians are calling for the president to go and pay, pay more attention to his health. I, I, I was reading the news and some, uh, some major groups are calling on the president. That if the president needs to travel out of the country, let him go. It's, it's not, uh, there's no point keeping him in a sort of trying to... Uh, make doctors attend to him when he actually has to 
leave the country to get proper medical attention. And of course, there has also been calls from Angles that we should keep praying for the president's health. But like Nigerians said, the first time we were told to pray, what exactly are we praying, praying for? Or like exactly. what, what is happening? So, so we are expecting that the I president... I think we know what we are praying about, actually. Well, until we receive an official... I, I think we know. It, it, it's not... I mean, he's, he said it before. Um, first of all, I want to. You, you made a statement about the fate of Nigeria hanging on the president. It doesn't hang on the president. I don't think the fate of Nigeria hangs on the president. It does have. A, he does have a role to play, but you know, it, the fate. Of, I mean, we've had. We've lost the president before, and the country moved forward. So the thing is, for me, he said it when he came back mm -hmm. that he's never been this sick in his life. He might not tell you. Um, um, this is what the exact problem is. Mm -hmm. But he, does, he did mention that I've never, he's never been this sick in his life. I mean, that's something to pray about. So when they say, I mean, it is where we didn't know. At, at that time, everything was shrouded in secrecy. There was this whole thing about um, he's all right, he's hale and hurting. So then we didn't know what to pray about. But when he came back and said, um, I've ne he's never been this sick in his life, then now we know that, okay, he's, he's actually sick. The problem is people just want um, the cabinet to come out and say, the, the president is resting because he's sick and that's what people want to say and you know Eli Mohammed has given a hint as to look he's, he needs to rest the doctors have advised that he rest because of his health and the bottom line here is if it's that bad if it's really that bad if it's I mean why not why stay back in Asuro yeah you know when you can actually go to really get the the whether it's within Nigeria or outside of Nigeria you know, one of the impressions I think is Nigerians we were told at some point that he had some hair problems we had to pray about that when he went for the checkup. He's come back and then had to go for two times last year, he did travel and then he, he's traveled this year again, and then this year he had to travel again. We've had conflicting reports from different quarters. Initially, it took a long time for even the spokesman, in addition to say the president yeah. was sick. After a while, he came up to say, it's okay for anybody to be sick. We understand the president was sick. But well, you, you could let us into what's wrong. If you told us at some point that he had some hair infections, he had to check up. We could at least know, but again, the presidency as a way should come to terms with the fact that the president isn't good enough to work, isn't in the right state of health to work. And that way we know that he's going to be away for a while. It isn't enough to tell us he has to work for home, he has to take some rest, he, re he re resume office for just a couple of hours and then have to go back home and then he missed a particular meeting. I would say this, this is a time we're calling for, of course, information, access to information so I'm celebrated, the press freedom yesterday, that we have some information, tangible, some accurate information to work with. We do not want them to come back tomorrow and say the president resume office again, and then he had to. It's complete, and it's been some series of conflicting, conflicting information. The basic thing, we should work with information, and not that the quarters come up, comes up with something, and another person comes up with a different thing. What exactly is happening? Is sick? Is strong? He needs to take, take some rest, rest because his health is not good enough. His wife came up to say his health isn't as mm -hmm. bad as we thought, or as people are making people, some other persons believe. The Minister of Information is saying the person has to rest because doctors say he should rest. Anybody could take some time away to rest. That's my opinion. But what doctors exactly can tell you. I mean, exactly you can all take some time to rest, rest. But when doctors say you should rest. That actually shows that there's something wrong with Dr. So, I mean, he, he, he said that. But my point is this. I don't have a problem with... The truth is, the, one of the basic problems Nigerians have is the issue of information. The Nigerians believe they're not getting enough information. I mean, mm -hmm. this is the president, and it's the president of the nation. So, people, we should get information as to what's happening to him. But he said it before, that he's not been really sick in his life. So, there's no point going forward from there. There is no need for... Um, secrecy. I mean, he's already said it. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is for the cabinet. Going forward from there, I mean, there's no point. He, uh, the man came out to say in January, in, in March rather, that he's never been this sick in his life. So just let it out. That's my point. But I mean, he said it. If people are saying let's pray, we know what to pray about. And hopefully we get a, a more, a cabinet that takes Nigerians more seriously and say this is exactly because we've been here before yes exactly. like, we, we've, we've been, been here, here before so we, we know already uh, this is not this is not a shocker for us anymore so we can i, I think nigerians can actually handle yeah. it no matter what the situation is and the good thing is nigerians actually love they love we love buhari they actually do love the president so and that's why people are so interested as to what's happening they tell us what's happening all right now we'll take a break and when we return more big stories do stay with us
Thank you for staying with us. The program is still AM Life. And just before we took the break, we looked at well, the reason that has been given for the absence of the president, the Nigerian president, from the Federal Executive Council yesterday. And away from that, are you still wondering whether or not Nigerians are actually still in the diaspora being smuggled out? The Director General of the National Agency for the Prohibition of Trafficking in Human Persons, Naptip Julie Okadondi, has said that about 1,134 1, Nigerians were deported in the past three months. And of course, for offenses for um, human trafficking, smuggling of migrants, and of course, not having valid travel documents. But the news is Nigerians are still being deported from def different countries in Africa and of course to Europe. And what we're still asking, what exactly is happening? Why are we still leaving the country, taking different illegal means? Oh, well, uh, this most surprising of all is, this is just a statistic for three months from February, between February and April 2017, lots of Nigeria have been deported from countries that you might actually not think of. Uh, let me just quickly read up uh, some of the statistics. 905 from Libya, 115 Nigerians were deported from Italy, and from Mali, 41 Nigerians were deported, from Burkina Faso, 26 Nigerians, from Ghana, 14 Nigerians, from UAE, that's the United Arab Emirates, 22 Nigerians, from Cameroon, one Nigerian, from Ivory Coast, it's Nigerians and from Togo to Nigerians. When uh, I know that there were some countries that wasn't ever expecting Nigeria to be deposited from, but the truth is, uh, some Nigerians are taking illegal means to go into other people's country. Uh, we we all know that there are requirements for getting visas for uh, for moving from one country to another, and people should actually take this process. But again, uh, some have blamed it on the situation in the country. But as as much as we we understand that. Uh, the country might not be a good place for some people to stay in, but again, going into other countries through illegal means, when you know that there's, there's no guarantee that you will be the, uh, you will be allowed to stay under, uh, and the I think the the uh, the organization also came up to say that there's still more Nigerians mm -hmm. and that their fates are hanging, like uh, they're soon going to be deported, and they they still trying to get statistics of number of um, and the number of illegal. My illegal Nigerians living in diaspora, which will be difficult to do because, again, if illegal people won't come out to say they, they are not, uh, they are mm -hmm. illegal in the country. But we do hope that for people, for our brothers who are in diaspora, if you do not have the valid document, it's better to return home than get deported. And, uh, and of course, the federal government is doing a lot. We, we see the way all of these agencies go out to meet those who are deported and try to settle them in all of their places, but it's not enough. That's Niger, uh, that the name of the country keeps, keeps coming up every time people are deported. Oh, 1,000 Nigerians deported, 200 Nigerians deported. And we do hope that people, if you have nothing to do, uh, like uh, BK, BK that BK very much, yeah. if you have no reason to travel, it's better to stay at home than keep wandering on a strange land. Well, that's easier said, you know, when you say that when people have nothing to do, they should stay at home. Because people always have, people are always looking for a better life for themselves. And there is this idea that a better life lies, you know, and out of the shores the of Nigeria. And that's why you find that most of the countries even listed are not even foreign countries, they're mm -hmm. African countries. Mm -hmm. So places like Togo, Libya, the I mean, you would, Kinefans, you would imagine that, I mean, Libya that is having issues with water. I understand that Libya is a border between Nigeria, you know, and, and uh, um, uh, Europe. But you, you find people still in this country, stuck in this country, the Togo, there's, I mean, there's Burkina Faso. This is a country that Nigeria has a better economy. Than, but yeah. people just have this mentality that once I'm out of this country, irrespective of where I am, you know, I'm going to do better. And that's why you, you still find that the report says that over 5,000 people are still waiting to be deported from Mali, and they're, they're willing to come back home. It, it just shows that there's, we need to do more. People are losing faith every day in this nation. We need to do more. People also themselves need to start thinking you know, out of the box, what can I do for myself? Because Togo might just be worse than Nigeria. Exactly. And when it comes to economy, Burkina Faso might just be worse than Nigeria. And that's why most of them are now thinking about coming up because they realize that, oh, look, the life I even had, you know, in Nigeria. Right. Back community. up to is better. I have because, I mean, even if you don't have anything to eat, you have a community that will say, oh, even if whatever is managed this Gary or manage this uh, rice, that there's a community that is willing to at least take care of you. You mm -hmm. have a family here that is willing to take care of you. So people always just think that, oh, there's a better life ahead. Let me go look for the better life. And there is a promise 
there is something about Nigeria that doesn't look like oh things are going to get better, but it will get better. It, it just yeah. we're just in a, a terrible place at this moment. But let's also uh, NAFIP has to do more. If mm -hmm. I when it comes to the area of human trafficking, you know we used to be in tier one in uh, human trafficking in the United States, but now we've come down to tier two because of the effort. They did so well at some point. And I remember when it was they were working with Wordcliffe. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, um, former vice president, wife of former vice president, Tiko Abubakar, you know, when she had that work left then. And it, they did a lot. I also remember the, uh, the wife of the former governor of Edo State, um, Eki Benedio, also doing so much in helping bringing, bringing back these ladies, uh, women who are affected by human trafficking. More has to be done. And that's why we moved to Tier 2. More has to be done. People, they tell you, oh, when you get there, this is, some of them even know what they're going to do over there. Mm -hmm. they, they say, oh, they like to be there. Some women already know. And they're still willing to go. Because they just feel I'm going to make more money. So more has to be done when it comes in the area of human trafficking. And of course, the idea that the grass is green now on the other side isn't true after all. If you ask the majority of those who have come back from the different countries mm -hmm. I went to, they'll tell you the story. I can listen to one say that you don't have any reason to leave your country because the country you think you're going to also have issues you're dealing with. Of course, like we mentioned, Libya is one country struggling as a way. Every country, even America, countries in Europe have a particular thing they're dealing with. And you really want to stay back, like you men mentioned, African countries basically have this communal thing about themselves. You do not have there is somebody looking out for you. There is somebody saying you're, you're a part of this country first. And that should that alone should make you want to stay back and find something to do. Jelat mentioned earlier and um, Mabiken Ariwa Dabiri, the presidential advisor to president advisor on foreign matters and diaspora say that there isn't anything you're looking for out there that you do not have back home in Nigeria. It only takes a closer look at what you can do for yourself and what you can make out of the situation. Again, we'll, we'll just make a referral to the make it in Nigeria. Nobody, there isn't anybody that can make something out of their lives in their own country. Only if you will decide to stay back and look at the resources that you have and those governments is providing. Of course, we cannot completely depend on the government. But there are governments, there are private organizations coming up with steel acquisition, skill acquisition programs that anybody could buy into to develop themselves. But the, 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 the conclusion is the grass is not greener anywhere else than it is in your own country. You only we, need we to stay back. We can't leave government out of this. That's yeah. the truth. Because we are saying people should come home. Mm -hmm. If everybody, if every Nigerian who was outside of this show oh. who decided to come back home, no, what we, are, we are... We are in, we're going That's to be, for those who are not, you know, um, developed enough to make it happen. Even those who are not developed enough. There are lots of Nigerians yeah, millions beyond of Nigeria. our imagination that are not developed outside of this. I mean, Nigerians are really doing well, you know, except for those who left legally or who left even illegally and then found ways to, you know, become legal in those countries. But if Nigerians who are not even legal, those in jail, now the government is deciding to put the jail swap on hold because mm -hmm. of the situation of things. We're supposed to be swapping prisoners with Britain. But now we're putting that on hold because of the situation of things. If everybody was to come back, I mean, right now we're, we are having people struggle for water. If we, if we even look at the statistics of how many people to a pipe bomb water, and I'm mm -hmm. talking about mm -hmm. bottle, not the one, because we know we don't have pipe bomb water, you know, as fleeing from government anymore. And how many people to uh, a particular school? How many people to, when well, you look at the hospital, how many people to a doctor? Imagine all of these people come back and the number increases. Now we've had you non know, population increase, we've not had infrastructure or facilities increase. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if these people were to come and join us, we are going to be in, it's going to be chaotic. So government has to start increasing infrastructure. I think it was Peter Obi that was speaking on May 1st, that yes. said, we're building flyovers. But we're not having, we're not walking on the road. I mean, who's going to walk on the flyovers? Roads are bad and you're building flyovers. So we must focus on infrastructure, a basic infrastructure, good roads, pipe of water, light, that when they return, at least life is not as difficult, mm -hmm. you know, when they return. Well, yeah, moving away from that, uh, in the United States yesterday, uh, something big happened in the United States. Uh, there's been killings. Something sad. Uh, something sad, yes, yeah, sad. And uh, of course, uh, there's been killings all along in the United States. Uh, it didn't start yesterday. It didn't start two days ago. It's been ongoing for a yes. long time, uh, which brought about the gun control debate that, mm -hmm. uh, that was, uh, of course, everybody heard about that. But again, on Wednesday, there was a shooting at the North Lake College where a man allegedly shot down a woman, uh, gone down a woman, killing her, and also committed suicide afterwards. Well, it really was a sad day, just not just in America, but because the rest of the world, America has recorded over thousands of mass shooting, suicide, gun violence. There's been an increase in the, the percentage of gun violence in mm -hmm. America, and well, like you mentioned, the fact that people just wake up one day and decide to kill someone and take their own lives. It's something nobody's come to terms with. 
Um, I, I think it's becoming a norm. Mm -hmm. I, I remember then when, and which is the sad part of it actually. Mm -hmm. I remember then when we had issues of Boko Haram in Nigeria. I mean, it, it's still there, but not as intense as it used to be. And then you go to a point where you hear that there is a suicide bombing in a place in the north, and you're like, mm. it because happens. you know, it has become a norm. And that's where, when, when tragedy becomes a norm, then it's there is a problem, actually. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem that America is having right now. The sporadic, in fact, just May 1st, you know, there was a, a shooting in San Diego, pool yes. party shooting. And it's becoming something that is almost like you're expecting it. And when it doesn't happen in a week and you're wondering, oh, this week was good because there was no shooting. But it, it, we didn't used to have this kind of stories. Um, whether terrorism, whether insecurity, whether gun control, America needs to start actually looking at mm -hmm. homeland security, not just, you know, uh, because it, we, they've sort of been so focused on terrorism. And most of the shootings have been as a result of terrorism. terrorism. This doesn't look like an issue of terrorism it, it, until investigation has still been done. But America needs to start focusing on homeland security. What's happening? What, what's the reason for, for shooting? Is it depression? Is it, uh, is it insanity? Is it really terrorism? What's happening in, within America? How do we deal with this issue? And the issue of gun control has to come up again. Exactly. Yeah. It's not an issue that I, I am, Donald Trump is not actually for it. But there is the Senate, you know, so they have to look beyond what the Republican Party stands for and what the uh, uh, Democratic Party, the uh, Democrats stand for, and really focus on what is good for America American at this moment yeah. since we're having these sporadic shootings. What should we do concerning con gun control? What should we do concerning um, whole homeland security? And that should be the focus, irrespective of what the president thinks. Very important. America is dealing with several issues, and they tend to be forgetting the fact that the um, the, the priority should be issues that are per, 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 peculiar to them, those on their own front. And you know, if this is not looked at, like you rightly mentioned, it's become something everybody, not just Americans, are getting used to. You walk about, you have access to the gun, and then anybody thinks they're going to play use until they look within, and like you mentioned, mm -hmm. the, the, the Congress needs to look very much into dealing with how much control people should have access to gun, how much control they have over gun use. Until they actually do that, it would become something everybody just looks at it and say, oh, it happened somewhere. And then since it didn't happen to my family, I get done with it. But again, we really could say so much around the issue of gun control in America. We only just say, a heart goes out to the family of the woman and everyone who's lost the family of To go sh shoot out, whether it was suicide, whether it was a, a, sh a mass shooting, wherever it is, a heart goes out to them. The rest of the world is saying, well, Send the condolences to America in a time like this. And uh, while talking about gun control, they should also pay attention to killings from police officers, killing of black men. Uh, uh, recently, I think uh, just yesterday, the U.S. Department of Justice has decided that they wouldn't charge the two white officers who killed Alton Sterling uh, last year in Louisiana, stating that there are no, uh, the, there are insufficient evidences to actually sanction them. And uh, this is bringing out a lot of things among Americans. The black Americans are, are asking for justice, but uh, of course, uh, the court deals with evidence based on facts and evidences. And we do hope that uh, such things wouldn't happen again. We've had cases of that again. As much as there are suicide, uh, suicide killings, ma mass shootings, there are police officers, again, who shoot out of their own, uh, well, we, we wouldn't know, out of their own volition, they, they shoot blacks on the streets of United States. And I, I'm, I'm hoping that the United States will be a safe place for people. Mm -hmm. People can walk out of their house and not not look uh, right and left to, uh, to check if someone is trying to aim at them, but again, that the world will be a better place and there will be peace mm -hmm. all across the world. While we have the Black Lives Matter, we're saying every life in America and the rest of the world matter. Every life matters. All right, now, while every life matters, we need to take a break. <laughs> and when we return, we would have a newspaper review segment, which is a morning brief segment. Just stay with us.
You're still watching AM Live coming to you from the studios of New Frontiers Television. This is the morning brief segment where we bring you headlines from the dailies. On the Guardian newspaper, government to revoke licenses of idle private refineries. Licenses lament financial straits. Six attention. Nigeria to invest 5.9 trillion naira in upstream sector. Details of those stories continues on page six of the Guardian newspaper. Buari still resting, fails to attend Federal Executive Council meeting again. Senate moves against Lawal's return, submits reports. Details of the story also continues on page six of the Guardian newspaper. And on news three, Nabde Kano meets Southeast Senators. Federal Executive Council okays 55.7 billion naira for road and aviation contracts. Senate confirms Ocheni Azan as ministers. And finally, on the front page of the Guardian newspaper, Donald Trump and his enemy number one. And on the front page of the Punch newspaper this morning, the major headline is, PDP says cabal running Nigeria as Buhari misses Federal Executive Council meeting again. And it's rather president not being fed through tube minister. Details are on page nine. Away from that above the nameplate, Oshimba Jopano to submit report on suspended NIA bus SGF on Monday, says presidency. 8 billion naira fund, Senate and Dite Lawal passes report to Buari, confirms two ministers to replace Muhammad and late Ocholi. You find details on pages 11 and 12. PDP crisis. Sharif McAfee clash over planned convention. And that's on page 9. We can't survive another civil war, salt and wounds. You find the details on page 11. And just below the picture insert, Boko Haram leader Shekau injured in Bono hair strike. And that's on page 13. Please arraign a kitty commissioner for theft. Page 10 has more details. Kate and Shaw friends return 8 million naira raised for sick boys to donors. Pages 4 and 5 will tell you more. Harebe Shola Akiri Dolu insists on restructuring. Restructuring. Hail Akiri Ade. Page 10 contains more details. UI law students jumps to death in hostel. Page 13. This is quite the sad one. We're just looking at it before we came back to look at the headlines. What's happening to our students these days? That's a sad one. Page 13 will tell you more on the headline. And finally, a picture inside of the scene of a bomb explosion in Afghanistan yesterday and the details behind it. Afghan security personnel at the site of a suicide attack targeting the convoy of foreign forces near the United States Embassy in Kabul yesterday. And finally, on the back page of the Punch newspaper of Good Luck Jonathan's Lamentations. And this is on Thursdays with Abimbola Adilakun. That's the most on the front and the back pages of the Punch this morning. Okay, moving on to the inside page of the Guardian newspaper, where we have the World Press Freedom Day report. Over one or two journalists killed in 2016. This is coming from UNESCO, the United Nations Scientific and Cultural Organization. Federal government false reports indicting Nigeria. Ganduje is committed to press freedom in Kano. Delta task journalist on ethics. Edo government pledges non-infringement. World body NGOs urge leaders to defend media and provide enabling environments. Uh, that's the much from the World Press Freedom Day report. And a quick look at some headlines from the news colon, still from the Punch newspaper. Don't provoke Kano to talk. This is coming from the indig indigenous people of Biafra. The warning. Servicom urges Nigerians to challenge service failures in MDAs. Court Dean Sarkoz says CCB chairman board members, that's the chairman of the Code of Conduct Bureau. And just as we looked at before we delved more into the program, 1,134 Nigerians deported in three months. And still more, Herbert Sanjo inciting Nigerians against Jonathan Ijo leaders, says Clark. Clark, that's the chief headwind Clark, who is an adult leader. And finally, 8 billion naira fund. Senate reports and dikes suspended SGF. And that's the mod from the news colon this morning. Moving on to the metro section of the Guardian newspaper. Residents flee as soldiers kill bronze houses in Ondo. Military hands over seven suspects to Lagos Police Commissioner. 
Businessman punches woman to death in Lagos. Three teens arrested over death of 13-year-old in Ekiti. Government demolishes shops at Ikeja Computer Village. How housekeeper slit throat of employer's mother. Lagos officials inspect bonds above of Lagos Palace. Only of Ife, only of Ife sympathizes. Says incident mere coincidence. Pastor rights minister alleges inhumane treatment in South African prison. Tension mounts as one 16-year-old is named Otochalu Oka. If you are, are wondering what that means, it's a royal title in Anambra State. And a 16-year, a one 16-year-old man has been named. That's that's in, in an age where we are calling for youth to take up leadership mantle. I wonder how many years this one 16-year-old man still has to live. But away from that, but that grill resident six and two chieftaincy despot Ogun task community leaders on development. Indian envoy bids farewell to its first secretary. That's the much from the metro section of the Guardian newspaper. And on to business and economy. Nigeria's total debt now 17.5 trillion naira, says the National Bureau of Stat Statistics. Federal government appoints transaction advisors for National Carrier Airport. Government completes 22 megawatts Agile Kuta power plant. That's a good one. And away from that, steel and business and economy. Customs revenue fell by 216.5 billion naira in 2016. And this is coming from the Comptroller General of Customs, Colonel Ahmed Ali, who was retired. And on to money. Central Bank of Nigeria directs banks to diversify portfolio, fund MSMEs. Bill, banks fail to subscribe fully to CBN's $100 million offer. And finally, for money, Nigeria needs to invest in growing entrepreneurs. A quick look at maritime. NIMASA, which is the Nigerian Maritime Administration and Safety Agency, its DG makes case for indigenous shippers and investors. And that's the mod from this column. Okay. okay, moving on to Guardian Business. FRC is set to release templates on MDA's operating surplus to curb fraud. Stakeholders task SMEs on competitive innovation. DSR does Dangote Sugar Refinery targets 100,000 jobs, 1 1.5 MT of locally refined sugar in 10 years. Inno innovative to drive agency banking with 1,000 agents. First bank to maintain focus on retail banking and consumer financing. Sun, that's the standard that organization of Nigeria, confiscates 100 million naira uncertified goods over false declaration. That's the much I'll be taking from the Guardian business section for today. And on bad bench news from the Punch newspaper, why Buhari's anti corruption work may not be sustainable. This is a statement made by the president of the Center for Social Legal Studies, Professor Yemi Adesheye, judge. Lawyers must see their practice as business. If you're a lawyer, you really want to check up on this report. Idigbe advocates PPP, which is Public-Private Partnership for Infrastructural Development. And still from the Bar and Bench News, why related released prisoners return to crime? Adetola Kazim is an activist and a, law a lawyer. Finally, from Bar and Bench, Hex AGM Assistant General Manager sues bank demands 13 million terminal benefits. And that's the mod from the Baron Bench News. Moving on to the editorial column of the Guardian newspaper. CBN's forex policy and debt of factories. On opinion, Buari's last duty. This is from Paul Onamwapo. And uh, there's also an opinion from Peter Obi. The making of a new Nigeria. Still on opinion. A new era, a new mandate. And finally, Obakiolu, the mob and failure of protocol. That's more from opinion and editorial columns of the Guardian newspaper. And now straight on to Punch Sports. Okagbari is set to compete in the IAAF Diamond League in Doha. A no contact with Joshua for Olympics, says Nigeria. Wimbledon prize money up to 2.2 million pounds. No black players in Italy should strike. This is coming from an ex Tottenham striker, Gareth Crooks. A steal on sport. Liverpool to honor Dalglish. MFM name prize for league top scorer, Ode. 
And finally, okay, I took that earlier, it's still on Joshua. I just take this on Ronaldo. Ronaldo told me the secret to his success, says Rio Ferdinand, a Manchester United legend. And that's the mod from Punch Sport. Before I take a look at the Guardian Sports, I'll quickly take in some headlines from Guardian Education. History teaching in schools as tool for national development. Africa needs more scientists to record scientific breakthroughs. Elizabeth University tasks pioneer graduates on excellence. Photo as the Federal University of Technology Owewe expels six final year students over protests. Students kick, threatening to shut down activities May 8th if colleagues are not recalled. And finally, on education, Amber Day's Midas Touch gets Lagos Varsity students hostel. And moving on to Guardian Sports, South Africa sets to name coach for Super Eagles Clash. Kano Tip Moses for African Footballer of the Year. Eight countries for Opikpe Road Race. And finally, Ronaldo is equal to Pele. Judge Best say, just, okay, I'll take that again. Ronaldo is equal to Pele. Judge Best says Neville. That's the much from Guardian Sports for today. We'll take a break and we'll return to take some news from the inside page of the newspaper. Don't go away. Thank you for staying with us still in the newspaper review that's a morning brief segment on AM Life and we're looking at some headlines from the papers. From the punch business and economy colon, customs revenue fell by two hundred and sixteen point five billion naira in twenty sixteen, says Ali. And just to take a part of the report, the revenue target of the Nigerian Customs Service for twenty sixteen fell by two hundred and sixteen point five billion naira. This is a report released by um, the Controller General of Customs, retired Colonel Amid Ali, while speaking to the members of the House of Reps yesterday. And of course, well, while Customs is given this amount as what they lost in 2000, 2016, I remember listening to um, the Minister of Finance, Kemi Adioshan, speak on the platform on May 1st, say that particularly in different sectors, but with particular reference to customs, there are leakages, and that's why each sector cannot record as much revenue as it that's should. True. Talking about the fact that times there are containers coming to the country, and the revenue that should be paid on them is not being, the revenues are not being paid. So same goes to different sectors that should, of course, generate revenue, but for some leakages, within them, they're not able to record as much money as they should in every, every year as a way. And she did mention how they're going to be blocking these leakages through technology. Well, so much around what technology can do towards the block blockage of leakages and sectors that are not generating so much revenue. But again, it's a call to different sectors. While NCS is reporting this, the different sectors should also look at how they can make for a blockage of the leakages that are not making them generate as much revenue as they should. And well, we should begin to pay attention to ICT in such a time as this, just as um, Kimi Adi Oshun has said that there would be some devices initiated to check up what's in the container and what money should be paid on them and that such monies are paid. That way we'll have, well, we'll get out of a recession as soon as we, we it's possible. Well, uh, it's funny that, um as much as the government is trying to generate revenue, uh, Nigerians are trying to look for means to evade, uh, evade payment of some of these deals. Uh, we know that there has been issues on uh, some of the duties, duty deals that the Nigerian custom collects from people. But again, uh, as much as we, we do expect that whatever task, whatever deals that people will be asked to pay will not be one that would uh, be, uh, be a burden on Nigerians, but again, we, we do expect that if you're a businessman, you know that you're supposed to pay dues 
on some of your containers. I was watching a video yesterday where uh, an officer of the customer was explaining how, so how a, a container was shipped into the country and it, it contained three different items. But uh, the person who shipped it in found a way to pay for just one item because it was supposed to be in separate containers, labeled separately. But it, there, was a, there was just a way the man managed to put all of the containers, in, uh, all of the items in one container and defrauding the custom of the monies they're supposed to get on all of the three, three, uh, three items brought into the country. We do expect that Nigerians become, as, okay, we understand that the situation, the economic situation might not give room for uh, people to have enough money as they used to have. But again, you should, these are things that you should do. And it's, it's a way of getting the nation, just like you said, Jim, okay, it's a way of getting the nation out of recession. And if everyone keeps defrauding the Nigerian customs, I, I wonder how we're going to get our money. And with, uh, just rightly, as you said, it's not just the custom that is suffering from some of these leakages. Uh, there are lots of agencies. I know that the, um, the Federal Inland Revenue Service also at the point said Nigerians are not paying taxes. We, we know that even in some states, we know that people and people don't pay taxes and when you when you talk to uh, when you talk to you'll be surprised when you talk to an average nigerian about tax and they're wondering uh why, they why should I, it is. why should i pay tax and people are asking you why should i pay tax if you're expecting the government to serve you you should also play your own part in that it is when you start paying your taxes and the government is not okay maybe they are not patching up that road in your community that you can talk or if they're not providing you pipe bomb water then you can talk we should pay our tax then we can begin to hold as much as we want to hold the government accountable we should do our own part of it also and we do expect that just like the government mentioned the use of ict uh, it's it's surprising that nigeria is one of the countries that seems not to be looking at uh the part of ict in the world where the world has moved beyond papers beyond mm -hmm. documents and we know that there, there are ways by which ict can help determine uh, and i remember when i was watching that video the next thing on my mind was that this one point in developed countries there will be a exactly. scanner that will that. show what exactly is there was in the container without even having to open the container so we do hope that the god that we move beyond the analog way of doing things to the digital way of doing things just to block some of the leakages and help generate more revenue into the country but away from that let me just quickly take a report of uh, Senate's confirmation of Ocheni and Azan as ministers yesterday, Professor Stephen Ikani Ocheni and Suleiman Zaman Hassan uh, were confirmed as federal, as their nominations were confirmed as ministers of the Federal Republic of Nigeria by the Senate. Uh, the confirmation was done, uh, the screening was done at, at the Senate yesterday. Ocheni is a lecturer of Kogi State University, who he would be replacing James Ocholi who died in a motor accident on March 6, 2016. Uh, that is Minister of State for Labor. Labor, Labor. yes, yes. He would be replacing the former Minister of State for Labor. And Suleiman Azan, who is also from Gombe State, would be replacing the former Minister of Environment, Amin Namwa Ahmed, who left the cabinet to join the United Nations as Deputy Secretary General. And um, well, we do hope that we congratulate these two men, and we do we do hope that they they contribute their own quota towards the development of the nation. And of course, for me, I'm not expecting anything less than what uh, their predecessors have done. And we and I'm, I'm sure that, especially for the Minister of Environment, he should be noting that he's stepping into a big shoe. Amina Mohamed has done a lot within the uh, little space she had, and we do expect that he continues in that dimension, and also do more than. Uh, than Amina Mohamed has done in a place. First, our congratulations to, of course, Professor Stephen Ocheni, like you mentioned, Diola, and Mr. Suleiman Azan, who both have been well approved of, confirmed by the Senate for over a year now. Kogi didn't have a representative yeah. in the Federal Executive Council, owing to the fact that the Kogi representative in the Federal Executive Council, late James Ocholi, died March 6, 2016, like you rightly mentioned. But of course, there are responsibilities ahead of these two people whose confirmation well was um, approved of by the Senate yesterday. You rightly mentioned Amina Mohamed is, is done so well. Before she even became the Minister of Environment, yeah. she's done the work towards the achievement of the SDGs. A couple of years during the administration of um, President Goodluck Jonathan. But so much now lies ahead of Stephen Ocheni and of course Suleiman Azan, who are both 
representatives for of Kogi and Gumbi respectively. What we're going to be, of course, looking forward to all of the things we're going to be doing. So much, um, Cheney said about the importance of the TSA for transparency and accountability, being a professor of accounting. And of course, um, the expertise of Suleiman Azan would be looked forward to, to what environment making for the, the protection of our borders. So yes, we, we have a complete, like we're a complete federal executive council yes. now. We're saying a congratulations. So there's two people again, and we're hoping that, yes, they, they would record much more than predecessors have achieved during the during their time. So we, we really could say much about them. But again, our eyes are on them and congratulations to you once again. Well on that note I uh, will take a break from the news from AM Live of course this is the end of the uh, morning, morning brief, brief that's the newspaper segment. So give room for news updates coming to you from the studios of New Frontiers Television. Don't go away as AM Life resumes after the news.
Very lovely morning to you. Thanks for staying with us. This is Morning News on New Frontiers Television. I am Precious Amayu. We turn our focus now to Nigeria. Owing to rising inflation and a depreciation of the Naira, the National Assembly, which for years has faced criticism over the lack of transparency and accountability over its budget, has increased its 2017 budget in the S appropriation bill to 150 billion Naira from the initial proposal of 120 billion Naira. This is just as the appropriation committees of the Senate and the House of Representatives would today lay the 2017 budget ahead of its consideration next week. The 2017 appropriation bill to be laid today would include details of the appropriated expenditure of the National Assembly in line with the promise made by his leadership to make public the details of his budget. The Sultan of Sokoto, Al Haji Sahad Abubakar, has lamented the disconnect between poverty alleviation programs and poverty in the country. The Sultan, in his key keynote address in Portacot River State, at a special forum for traditional rulers at the ongoing Golden Jubilee celebration of River State, said that governments in the country had invested so much in various forms of poverty alleviation programs with little impact on the poor, calling for concerted efforts against poverty. The monarch, who cited books by an Islamic leader, kicked against begging as a way of life, saying that God encouraged productive engagement of the self. He advised the rich to endeavor to replicate the good things they see overseas in the country. A MENA High Court has granted a former Niger State Governor, Babangida Aliyu, and his Chief of Staff, Omar Nasco, bail with an option of fine. The presiding judge, Justice Aliyu Mayaki, said the bill conditions for Aliyu will be 150 million naira with two sureties who would deposit the certificates of occupancy of two landed properties worth 200 million naira each. While ruling on the bill of Omar Nasco, who was the People's, Demo People's Democratic Party PDP governorship candidate in the state in 2015 election, Mayaki said a bill would be granted with an option of 100 million naira, even as Nasco would provide two sureties with landed properties located within the state and worth 150 million naira each. In an interview with newsmen, counsel for Nasco, Maman Usman, however, said the bill terms were too harsh, saying he, Nasco, was a man of exemplary character who would never jump a bill. Still on the judiciary, a federal high court in Lagos has convicted and sentenced an official of the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, Yisa Adedui, following a plea bargain arranged, arrangement he reached with the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC, in the charge brought against him, former Petroleum Resources Minister Deziani Alisi Maduke, and two other officials of the commission, Christian Wonsu and Tijani Bashiru. They were alleged to have conspired to directly take possession of 500.76 million naira, which formed part of proceeds of unlawful act. Trial judge is Justice Mohammed Idris. The plea bargain agreement is dated May 2nd, 2017. The court arrived at a decision after the EFCC rearranged in an in absentia Alice in Madoke alongside Christian Wonsu and Tijani Bashu, both staff of INEC. The Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation, NNPC, has commenced a move to attract 20 companies to make substantial investment worth $20 billion in order to meet the federal government's target of increasing refining capacity in the country. Investigations show that the Apex Oil Corporation has in the past few weeks been engaging with the investors in order to inform, educate, as well as assist them to prepare various packages required in the process of applying for license. Confirming the development on the sideline of a forum on modular refinery in Lagos, General Manager Refining Directorate Mr. Ahmed Dalladi, who is involved in the process, disclosed that the NNPC decided to play the role in order to guide potential investors to invest in the sector. He said this became very important, especially as many potential investors did not know much about the sector. Now the federal government may get the Central Bank of Nigeria, CBN, to relax the ban imposed on 41 items from official foreign exchange window. Vice President Yemi Ushibanjo said the government would consider policy-driven restrictions to promote local manufacturing of 41 items such as rice and toothpicks. He said in stabilizing the macroeconomic environment, they have focused on aligning fiscal with monetary policy and nudging the central bank toward the objective of more market-determined exchange rates. Recall that the Apex Bank in 2015 introduced a policy 
restricting the restricting importers of some 41 items from sourcing from the official foreign exchange window in order to support the Naira after it was hit by a fall in oil prices. The policy has, however, led to the closure of many plants in various sectors. And with that, we come to the end of Morning News here on New Frontiers Television. Thanks for staying with us. I am Precious Amayo. AM Live continues in just a moment.
You're still watching AM Live coming to you from the studios of New Frontiers Television. And of course, that was the news from our news desk. And moving on to our topic for today, it is no longer news that uh, the world is in turbulent times. We're facing crisis all across the world in case of terrorism. In recent happenings, uh, they just on Sunday, there was a terror attack in Egypt. On Prime Sunday, a church was blown up. Uh, there was an attack in Sweden recently also, and in places like Turkey, London, uh, all across the world, there's a case of terror attack in one place or the other. And this calls for, uh, so for urgent, urgent uh, attention, which is why today on the show we'll be discuss global terrorism. And I won't be doing the discussion alone. I have Mr. Tony Ehigiato in the studio. He is a convener of Yes, You Can Project Africa. And he is also a security expert who would be helping us analyze the issue of global terrorism in the world. You're welcome. Sir. Thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning. Well, um, there's been a rise in terrorism in, from January up till now. We've had lots of cases of terror attacks as, as, uh, from January up till yesterday. We've had 357 attacks as a whole. And of course, uh, 2,245 deaths caused by terrorism. What is your overview of terrorism in the world at large? Terrorism in the world is increasing by the day mm -hmm. and um, though there are uh, there have been attempts or let me put it this way um, there have been um, serious attempts by various governments um, to deal with terrorism but it looks like the more they deal with it the more the thing is you know is, is going wide the more it, it escalates uh, terrorism is actually growing big in the world. And um, I just pray that we will get to the point where terrorism will be, will be cut off finally because it's, it's worse than AIDS. Oh, well. It's worse than AIDS. Terrorism is worse than AIDS. You have AIDS, you know you can go to the hospital and get mm -hmm. drugs. Yeah. But with this, you don't know where it's coming from. You don't know who the next person is. You're living in fear. It's 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 worse. It's it's bad. It's it's horrific. Okay, uh, you you mentioned that terrorism seems to be increasing, and we know uh, after the 20, 2001 attack on the United States, there was a global declaration on war on terror. But yeah. it, but recently now the the war on terror began in 20, uh, 2001, which makes it sixteen years. This yeah. year, it is 16 years of war on terror. Why this hasn't made the world any safer, just like you mentioned. Why is this so? Now, it is so because terrorism, if we look at global terrorism, mm -hmm. now, we are looking at um, the act of a crime or violence, mm -hmm. um, act of a crime or violence intended to, um, intended, uh, let me look at how to break it down. Uh, act of crime or violence that is in, intended to coerce a government or uh, uh, something that is um, in, intended to, to promote a political or uh, religious ideology. We underline political and then religious ideology. And so because it is meant to coerce a government a society or a group of individuals or intimidate them into accepting something that the people who feel grieved want and then it is on the line of politics stroke religion mm -hmm. and then ideology is in it yeah. it becomes a big problem so you look at the situation where a group of people have been schooled or brainwashed to do something. And the most difficult thing you can do in life is to change a man. Before you change a man, you expose him to the information you want him to get because every man is a product of information. We're a product of the things we hear. So you have a particular set of people who have been schooled. They take them to a particular training. They talk to them and brainwash them for nine, six, maybe one, two, three, four years. 
They school them in what they want to do. Now, when you have a hundred people who have been brainwashed, who have been told that when you kill, you are going to heaven, and 70 virgins are waiting for you, or when you kill, you are doing your God a service, on that line, it becomes difficult for you to stop it. It's an ideology. And somebody said the only way to deal with an ideology is to use an ideology. The only way to deal with an ideology is to use... So it, it, terrorism, the fight against terrorism globally is going to take a long time because we're talking about what I have heard, what is in my subconscious. And because that thing is now in my subconscious, it becomes something I do every day. It, it's, it, it becomes more like an instinct. I don't have to think of doing it. It is now a part of me. So before you can deal with that, it's going to take quite a number, a number of time. It's going, to take, it's going to take some days, if not years, to okay. deal with, to deal with global terrorism. But the thing is, the fight should not die down. The fire should not go down. It has to keep going up. That's, mm -hmm. that's the thing. It has to keep going up. See, because this terrorism of a thing, I'm telling you, is worse than cancer. Before you know it, it's spreading. So you, if you don't deal with it quickly, then we, we have a bigger, a bigger menace okay, to uh, handle. Okay, talking about uh, how the fight should not go down, we've, uh, we've seen in recent times uh, counter terror attacks, where, and uh, there's a recent case between the United States and Syria, uh, the counter attack by President Donald Trump against the sleeping, uh, the chemical that was used to kill people in Syria. There was a counter attack, uh, airstrike. How should people react? And there was a call also by the Prime Minister of Russia during the terror attack against France that the language terrorists understand is the language of force. How then should the world react? So global terrorism, if you're saying that uh, the fight shouldn't die down, but it's going to take a while to yeah. combat global, how then should the world react? No, you see, the first thing is education. Now, when I say education, I'm not just talking about going to school, school okay. reading and writing. The government of each country, if I would use, for example, if I'll come down to Africa, the government of countries in Africa must invest in orientation programs. They must go down to the grassroots. It is the same way when they want to come into office, the same way they go to the grassroots, the same way they go to the woman selling pepper mm -hmm. in the, the very or the most remote area in their constituency, and they seek for the woman's vote. Mm -hmm. That's the same way they have to do the campaign. It has to be a, a strategic, on purpose, on target campaign and the thing is i want to tell them to stay away from it number two then they also have to use religious leaders because if the religious leaders for example in the northern part of nigeria if they come together if the emirs there come together and the governors come together and they put their feet on the ground to say terrorism must die because Terrorism is coming from that side. That is where these terrorists come in from. I don't care what name you give them. Headsmen, cowmen, goatmen, whatever name you give them, it's coming from that side. If they put their foot on the ground, they say no. It's going to die. See, because these people will not know there is no longer a safe abode for their goldfish. And because the fish is gold, it's easy to catch. You see it there. So that's where it's going to start from. Now, when you start from that place, you can now move into combatancy because um, if you do not have uh, the, the technology that is required to deal with this thing, then because these people have gone, they've gone, they've, they've upped their game. So you also need the technology to deal with them and then keep, keep fighting there. But honestly, one message I'm going to pass across to you, whatever terrorist is listening, whatever group, is listening right now whatever they are fighting for doesn't make sense why do you want to kill to please the person you call your God you are telling me that if you kill another person your God is happy because that person is an infidel and when you get to heaven your God is going to give you a reward 
does your God need you to kill somebody for? If your God is God indeed. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm just trying to say that God does not need man to kill for him. So you find out that this is an extremist act. This is extremism. I don't believe that Islam is a, is a, is a, is a, is a, a religion of vampires. I put it that way. But I believe that there are people in it who have taken advantage of some things, you know, all because they want control, they want power, they want a voice, they want to be heard, they want to be in charge. And that is why you see all of these things happening all over the world. Okay, uh, the Middle East has been said to be the hub of terrorism. Uh, that is where the Al Qaeda group developed from the Taliban's the ISIS, ICO, and uh, of course we know that the Boko Haram has an affiliation with ISIS also. Is the Middle East really the, ter the hub of terrorism as it has been pronounced? Or there are certain circumstances that made terrorism gain its ground in that particular region? Yeah, um, you see, because it is on the line of religion, the Middle East is the home of religion. Okay. Now, um, some school of thought, how true, I don't know, but some school of thought uh, have come together to say that um, terrorism actually started from uh, a backstabbing of some people who uh, worked with um, um, some of these um, world powers in the um, European world, in the Western world. And um, after they used them, they dumped them, and then because some people wanted to, you know, control them, you know, all, all, all the stories and eventually terrorism came up and then something happened and then, you know, they picked it up. You look at Russia, the case of Russia, uh, when it was um, USSR, the role United States played and, you know, different things like that. You go to Korea and, and all those countries and it, it looks like terrorism started from backstabbing. But nevertheless, Okay, let, let's, let's, don't, don't, don't let me debate now. It started from there and then it got into the Middle East. And then it is strong in the Middle East because of religious inclination. It's inclined to religion. And the moment it's inclined to religion, a lot of sentiments come in. And because of that, it becomes difficult to deal with. So, it's, it's, I would say that, yeah, the, the, the Middle East is the hub of it. The Middle East is the hub of it. Okay. In, in reaction to uh, the Middle East being a hub of terrorists, President Donald Trump really assumed office in January this, uh, this year, 2017. He declared a ban on seven major Muslim countries, uh, which the majority of them are from the Middle East, yes, yeah. then uh, two from Africa. Uh, is, is this a step in the right direction in trying to cope global terrorism the president of america donald trump uh -huh. i believe that donald trump did what he thought was right okay. because what he did is an act to protect his own people and his own country so if i'm going to do anything to protect my country and you say it is wrong then well it is not left it is now it is now left, uh, it becomes subjective. It depends on how you now want to see it. For him, he feels that these nine countries have produced terrorists and these nine countries are finding their way into America. And so the only way to, let's, to start from a point, let's stop the people from coming in. If you don't have any uh, genuine reason to come into America, you don't have papers to come in, then stay back in your country. I don't see anything wrong with that. I don't see anything wrong with that. You see, the, the, the good side of this is this. These countries now should go and sit down and then start working on themselves. Start cleaning up whatever mess they have made in time past. Because if I become the president of Nigeria today, I might eventually do the same thing. I'm a, I will go to the north and tell my people, stay at the border, Anybody coming in who does not have any genuine reason to come into Nigeria, send the person back. Because, see, terrorism, or let me put it this way, terrorists 
operates like this. When they want to strike in a country, they look for people in that country. Now, at first, it used to be the terrorists themselves going into those countries. But now, what they, what they now do is they look for people in the country, they recruit these people, they brainwash them, and then they send them on suicide missions. So if Donald Trump right now has um, succeeded in keeping them from coming in, now I believe that is a good step, one of the right steps in the right direction. The next thing now is to come into America and then start looking at how he can pick out individuals that have these tendencies. Not jail them necessarily, but maybe rehabilitate them. Okay, uh, well, you, you've agreed that the step Donald Trump took is in the right, in the right direction. But in a time where majority of uh, countries are facing war, especially in the Middle East and our part of Africa, and there are lots of migrants moving from one country to another. Most, and most nations have opened their doors, wide, uh, their doors for migrants to move in. So are you saying that uh, there should be a call for limitation of migrants or total ban on people moving in and out of countries, especially from major countries that have been marked as terrorist zones? No, this is it. Any country who feels any country who feels, oh, I can handle these people. Okay. Let the countries take them in. If England feels they can handle them, let England take them in. If America feels I, I cannot handle these people, they've done me so much damage. I don't even know who is who. I don't have enough security for myself, my people, and the people coming from outside. It's not, there's nothing wrong with it. So if a country says it's going to be total ban, that means that is what the country feels best for itself. If a country feels, oh, it is partial ban, then the country feels that is best for itself. But to now say that because uh, for example, Afghanistan, not everybody in Afghanistan is a terrorist. Yeah. Not everybody in um, Kenya is a terrorist. I, I, was, I was browsing and I was trying to see um, a, a, a very nice place to go in Christmas or vacation. And then when I was browsing, I, I saw an information posted by the Department of State in, in America that uh, there are some places in Kenya you should not go to because of terrorist attack. Okay. Now, not everybody in Kenya is a terrorist. Mm -hmm. So, but because Kenya has been painted, or because Afghanistan or Iraq has been painted to be, or flagged to be a country of terrorism, everybody that comes from Iraq looks like a terrorist. So, it now becomes your job to see if you want to go into it, okay, you see the good ones from the bad ones. And the thing is, how do you even know the good ones from the bad ones? So you, you find out that we still have to see, it, it is still the responsibility of the leaders of each country to ensure that they kill terrorism. It can die. There was a particular time that, uh, there was a rumor that um, Boko Haram people were coming down to the south. There was a time that rumor was flying. And, you know, if, if we were around then, you would see measures people took. Once they see any strange person on the street, I mean, they ask you, what are you looking for? I can recall a particular incident where in a bank, I don't want to mention the name of the bank, <laughs> where the bank, and then this um, a man from Niger came in. He wanted to withdraw money. He was with his nylon bag beside him and then he's on top man and everything and the moment the guy entered my god everybody on the queue we turned and were like eh -eh, god whatever yeah, yeah. sin we have for, we have committed please forgive us it looks like today is the last day and then the man was innocent he sat down he dropped the bag by the door the security man said no 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 no, no. please pick your bag and i, I could i could see that I could see the, the pain. I could see the, the emotional uh, uh, um, effect. It was going to have on the man. 
So we need to see, we need to go back. The, the leaders of countries of the world must go back and tell their people, why, why, what do you want to gain? Let people, if I want to be a Christian, let me be. If you want to be a Muslim, why not be? You do what you think is best, but do not infringe the right of the other person and do not go against the law of the land. Enjoy yourself. Most of the time, see, terrorism is always an attempt to either intimidate or coerce a group of people or a society or a government to do or accept something. And it is always along the line of political or religious ideologies. Okay. I would say it's, it's a greedy thing. Okay. Uh, talking about the react reactions of people to terrorists, and of course, how, how each leaders of the country should react to terrorists. There, there has been uh, during the uh, I'll take us back to the President Bush attempts to combat terrorism. We saw that uh, some of the things the administration did then was to go offensive on the war against terrorism, a counter attack on Afghanistan as at the time, and of course uh, there was a deployment of the United States military forces into the Middle East, which led to, which is still part of the things the world is still battling with up till now. And again, uh, there was an attempt to uh, promote democracy in the Middle East, which yes. they've still been able to do up till now. There's been, there's been reactions. Most of all these groupers come up to say, uh, I was reading a statement by Al-Qaeda, and I think I see some of their members, saying that their reactions, the terror reactions, are because of US policies. Uh, they are, they are reacting to policies made by world leaders against the Middle East. So if you, if, if you are now saying that leaders should be made to decide how they, how they best want to combat this, wouldn't we see a repeat of what has happened? Because you, you mentioned it yourself, that the war against terrorism has not even done a bit, a tiny bit, in quenching terrorism, it has further aggravated it. If we all decide that there's a ban to migrants coming in, or there's a ban on a particular group of people, won't this further aggravate terrorists to attack other nations? Yeah, it, it will. But that comes when the desirable is not available. The available becomes desirable. You see, if you're saying that because somebody made a policy and the policy is not favoring you, and because of that you want to fight back, that's not how it is done. If somebody makes a policy and it's not favoring you, you call the person, you have a round table talk, and then you sort things out. Going violent does not solve anything. Now, US might have had its own contribution to these things. Want everybody to become democratic. The truth is, not everybody will run a democratic system of government. So, what should have happened is allow each country run the kind of government that fits the people. Listen, it's when, let me bring in the concept of marriage because a country is like group of people coming together, married mm -hmm. two people coming together. Now, no two marriages are the same. You cannot use a formula working for marriage A and then bring it to marriage B because the two individuals, the parties in all, in, in the two marriages are not the same. Your marriage cannot, what you do in your marriage might not work in my marriage because we are not the same. Do you understand what I'm talking about? So if in my marriage, if democracy is working, it might not work in your marriage. Your marriage might be oligarchy. It might be which other one is, you know, anarchy. it might be anarchy. And it looks like the anarchy is working in your marriage. It, it all depends. Let the people, be, see, because the concept of democracy really is the people for the people by the people. So let the people come. So if the people in the Middle East are saying this is a kind of, government we want let them come together let them run themselves but the thing is this what you should ensure is that the rights of individuals are protected for example 
I don't believe in a barbaric act that says, in, in some of, uh, you know, this way that uh, your man is a woman, the, the, the woman cannot be what she believes she's supposed to be. The woman is kept in the house, and all she does is, you know, make, 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 uh, make, 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 cook food, make babies, and clean the house. I mean, all she's good at is the kitchen and the other room. No, 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 that, that's, 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 that's not it. Everybody's rights should be protected. But if you believe in your country, you want a monarch to run the government, good. Do it well. If you believe you want a federal system of government, do it well. If you believe um, you want a parliamentary system of government, do it well. Ensure that whatever you do, there is justice, there is equity and fairness in it. And I think this whole issue of terrorism will go down. But beyond that, because we human beings are insatiable, because we are always greedy, we always want the extra, there are still people who want to control everybody and they want to have a say. That is why an idea like terrorism might not go off as soon as possible because there are still some people who believe that this is the only weapon we have and this is the only way we become relevant. If not, Boko Haram should have been killed in Nigeria. Okay, moving to Nigeria, that, that was where I was going to. Let's, let's bring it home, where Boko Haram uh, is, is, a, is a menace that we've been dealing with for a very long time. Since 2011, uh, it's, been, it's been on, I, 2010, since 2010, Boko Haram has been, has been on in the nation. And uh, at a point, at the point, uh, the government was celebrating the fact that Boko Haram is dying off. But recently, there has been attacks. Yeah. And uh, the, the group, the group has not surrendered, and there's been we've not been able to put a face to the group. There, there was a time where there was a call for a negotiation, but nobody, nobody came up to see anything. Why are we still dealing with Boko Haram? Even after government has tried all measures, our military men have been sent to to the Boko Haram zone to try to combat this, and they've they've been a a, a case of gaining and regaining te uh, territories. But why why are we still combating with this issue at this time? You see, when Boko Haram started, mm -hmm. it was very political. It was a political tool to destabilize the government of um, the president that was there then. And um, eventually it grew and became this big monster that we all now are trying to look at how to deal with. The military has done its best based on the facilities available to them. Today. They have tried. I mean, we should, we should celebrate them. One of the reasons um, Boko Haram is still on, one, there are moles in the system. There are moles in the system. That's number one. Number two, there are religious leaders who still believe in this devilish ideology. Anybody who is not a part of my religion is um, a kafiri, so if, if that's what they call them, and then let them all be killed. They still believe in the jihad that refers to killing people. And they believe, because of their religious belief, they feel if they are not from us, wipe them off. Number three, there are people who are using this as a political tool. Number four, there are individuals <clears throat> who are, um, how do I put it, who are, there are individuals who are making a living <clears throat> out of it. There are individuals who are encouraging it <clears throat> in order to, uh, in order to, okay, make a living out of it and then also uh, create some form of um, uncertainty and instability because it is in that instability or that chaos that they get to get whatever they want. So it is on the border of politics and religion and because of this too it is still lingering up till this moment. We have not yet gotten to a point in Nigeria where we all can come together and deal with this thing because we are still on tribal divides. 
I'm from this side, you are from that side. Power belongs to the north. The east is saying, no, 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 no. We have been kept out of it for a long time. And, you know, all these things are in. So, because of politics, religion, ethnicity, these three regions, they have come together to strengthen or further calcify uh, the, the, the existence of Boko Haram. Until we say no. Until the man from the north stands up to say, okay, I am a Nigerian and I must solve this problem and will not bring in any form of sentiment. Then we'll de see, to deal with Boko Haram, we do not need six months to deal with them. We don't need six months. All we just need is people who will stand up and say, we are going to kill this monster today. And once all of them gather together and they speak with one voice, I'm telling you it will be over. Because this is it. How do you explain it? Um, some vigilantes go and apprehend a car that is um, alleged to carry guns um, or something, arms. Then they call on people who are supposed to protect the people. And then at the end of the day, the people who are supposed to protect the people come and then protect the people carrying the arms. And then at the end of the day, people get killed. And up till today, nobody has said anything about it. Headsmen are killing people. What I grew up to know is, if you say somebody is headsman, you see him with a big stick on his neck, and then he moves his cattle. Is that not? But this time around, they have changed the big stick to a very fine AK-47. So I'm wondering, what do you need AK-47 for? And then in different parts of the country, people are daily being killed. Women are daily being raped. Nobody is saying anything about it. But it is interesting to know that something happened in Ife. And in a space of two, three weeks, 20 people were arrested. And the government said that the people who were arrested are the people who caused the mayhem. How? So if the government can arrest the 20 people that caused the mayhem in Ife, why has it been difficult for them to arrest the people causing the mayhems in the northern part of the country? This is the reason Boko Haram, see, it is the reason Boko Haram cannot be solved. And the body language of Mr. President is not helping matters. We actually do hope that Boko Haram gets solved as soon as no, possible. No, that, that, that's true because if people fought in Ife and you arrested them and the thing died down and people, some people are, they are killing people in other parts of the country and you are finding it hard to get them. People are dying in the north. You are finding, hard to, finding it hard to get them. How are you going to solve it? It means it is either there is a more somewhere or you are not sincere about dealing with this issue because the people we are talking about they are the king's men the family men of the president and so you're feeling oh i don't want to touch them because if i touch them it becomes a big issue if you don't do it if there are sacred cows in the society how do you want to clear up this problem Somebody said that what Donald Trump did was bad. And I told them, I said, number one, you don't negotiate with terrorists. You do not smile at terrorism. If a man will use a chemical weapon to destroy lives, mm -hmm. then it should be an eye for an eye. So responding simply is telling that guy, come, you are naughty. He's telling him, you do not have the monopoly of madness. So if you are doing what is wrong, understand that there are people who are also equal and they are capable and they have the capacity to do worse than what you are doing. So it was a check thing. When are we, when would the government of Nigeria stand up? When would they arrest somebody in the north who killed someone? When would they arrest, um, um, what's the name, when, when would they arrest um, um, any headsman found with a gun? What would he has, what is what is a cattle rarer doing with a gun? He's not a soldier, he's not a police. What is he doing with a gun? Okay, well, well, well we're calling on the government of, uh, of different nations across the world to rise up to the 
fight against terrorism. What are the things that an individual can do to prevent us from being victims of terrorist attacks? Because we all know that in all those major attacks, it's been the civilians suffering, uh, bearing the brunt of each and every attack. And uh, let's bring it down to Nigeria. People, people are walking on the streets, and before you know it, a bomb is is ignited across the street and people become victims. So what, what should individuals do in helping combat terrorism in the world? Um, if, if we bring it down to, let's take the Nigeria as a case study. Um, the first thing is just um, individual vigilance. Okay. If you're walking on the street, you see a bag hanging somewhere long. If you can't check it, call the attention of people on the streets. If you see, for example, on, on my street um, two, day, two, three days ago, a woman walked in the street and then um, she walked into a house, a house you don't know anybody in, then she goes into a room and then somebody quickly came out. What are you looking for? What do you want? And the woman said she was looking for someone. What is the name of the person you are looking for? She couldn't say anything. So everybody gathered to rescue that particular situation. So individual, intel individual uh, uh, vigilance. When you go out, be, sh be careful of the places you go to. When you see any strange thing, don't just overlook it. Ask questions. When you, he said, when you, when you see somebody with a questionable behavior, Somebody is manifesting in a questionable way. I mean, you, you, for example, I'm in a mall, and then all of a sudden, I see this guy, he's fidgeting, he's sweating, he looks confused, unsettled. The next thing I should ask myself is, who is this person? Ask him, come, what do you want? What, 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 what's the problem? Give him some space, if you, want, if you will. What is the problem? And if the guy is not forthcoming, ah, Call the security people there. And if you can't call the security people, look for the next exit and move out of the place. See, it starts from you. It starts from you being vigilant. Number two, another thing we can do now, apart from we being vigilant, apart from we seeing things and calling the attention of, uh, of, of, of authorities, the government also need to... Look, before we even go to the government, you and I can invest in orientation program. For example, the TV stations can do something. How do you know what are the likely traits of a terrorist? Somebody who is coming to bomb your area. What are the likely traits? For example, what are the likely traits of a Boko Haram person? I think, uh, uh, I don't want to mention the name of the TV station now. Uh, there's a particular TV station that does it when they want to do their news. They give you, you know, just one or two tips on how to identify these people and what you can do. Now, radio stations, TV stations, terrestrial digital should also do this. Radio station, because people listen more to me, so radio stations should do this. Television stations should do it. We should have banners, billboards outside. There should be conferences, seminars in pockets, you know, pockets of places where these things will be talked about. In secondary schools, we should take it to secondary schools. We should take it to, you know, to the university. We should take it to offices and talk to, we should sensitize people so that when you are going on the road and a car is parked, the moment a car is parked for too long, you start asking, I do it a lot. I see who is the owner of this car this car has been parked here for the past two hours and before you know it people start coming out you know that kind of a thing we, we need to we need to do that then we need now to move to the level of technology the government now must invest in technology to combat um terrorism, terrorism. yes in technology All military right. technology whatever kind of technology they want to use okay. to combat it yes. okay on that note we'll, that, that's what we'll be calling it off on this show thank you so much for thank coming. you thank you very much thank oh, you we very all much. know that our 
terrorism is a global menace that the world has to deal with. Be vigilant, be vigilant. I think that that's the major thing, be vigilant. It says usually the citizens will bear the brunt. And we do hope that the world will become a peaceful day. And of course, people can sleep in their houses with their two eyes closed. And we do hope that every nation in the world would rise up to fight terrorism. And terrorism will be a thing of the past in the world. On that note, we call it over on AM Live this morning. Do join us again tomorrow as we bring you another topic. An exciting conversation. My name is Adiola Adigoke. Do you enjoy the rest of your day?